Welcome to Christ's Hope, and we're glad you're here. Hope you're ready to worship God together as his church and hear his word preached and um, share in the Lord's Supper together. Um, it's always just such a joy to be with you all, so let's get started and sing an old hymn, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Fellowship, what a joy to find leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all the lungs. For the reading of God's Word. From Psalm 47. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. How awesome is the Lord Most High, the great King over all the earth. He subdued nations under us, peoples under our feet. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loved. God has ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing to Him a song, a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on His holy throne. And from Revelation 19, then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Then the angel said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. At this I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, Do not do it. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Thank you. 
I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is alive. I raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me. I raise a hallelujah. I will watch the darkness flee. I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery. I raise a
beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name.
in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. Uh, it's my favorite verse that describes why we observe communion in one verse. In being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Why would we sing about a wonderful and powerful name? Because in the very next verse, the Holy Spirit has Paul write, Therefore God has given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Whether this verse inspired the writer to compose this very appropriate song about a wonderful and powerful name, I know not. But it certainly <coughs> corresponds with the verse I've just read. As we pray, prepare our hearts for communion this morning, several writers have taken in hand to write about the name of Jesus. And I just want to remind you of a couple. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There is something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus. Like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth adore. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. That's because he is just the same as his lovely name. And that is why I've come to love him so, because Jesus is the sweetest name I know. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, as we remember Jesus in the way he has requested us to do so just now, we remember his wonderful and powerful name. How precious the name of Jesus is because it speaks of his mission that restored us to fellowship with you and gives us hope in this life and in the life to come. It is in that wonderful and powerful name we pray. Amen. Of course, the greatest gift that was ever given, uh, we just celebrated that um, as we took communion, remembering God sending his only son to die for us. Um, but we have many other gifts that we've been given, that we're given every day by God. And there's an old hymn I sang gr growing up called, Count Your Many Blessings, Name Them One by One. So under your chair, you have uh, a little card. If not under your chair, maybe the chair next to you. Go ahead and grab those and uh, grab a pen. If you're sitting next to a gentleman, maybe hand him one too. And we are going to just take a couple minutes and write down any of the blessings in your life that you can think of that God has given you. Big ones like our health, um, small personal ones maybe that no one else knows but you. Um, abstract things and concrete things, whatever you can think of. For the next couple minutes, just make a list as you're writing these things, praying in your mind uh, a prayer of gratitude to God for everything he's given us.
I don't know about you, but I have more blessings than I have time to write them down. Um, keep that card with you for a few weeks in a place where you'll see it every now and then and just remember how much we're blessed. Um, it says in James, every good, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And I love the way the message renders this verse. So my very dear friends, don't get thrown off course. Every desirable and beneficial gift comes out of heaven. The gifts are rivers of light cascading down from the Father of light. There's nothing deceitful in God, nothing two-faced, nothing fickle. He brought us to life using the true word, showing us off as the crown of all his creatures. Father, we thank you for all these good and perfect gifts. We thank you for uh, being such a giving, loving Father um, who blesses us every day, even when we forget, even when we take things for granted. Um, but just now, we do thank you, and we remember and we know that all good things come from you, and we give you glory and praise. We're so grateful, and you're so good. In Jesus' name, amen.
the essence of worship right there. God, you're so good and worshiping and declaring God's worth. Well, this week is uh, the last week of our stewardship series, so to make sure the concepts are in green, let's go over them one more time. What does stewardship not mean? 
giving and money. It's not equal to that. What does that word stewardship actually mean? Yeah, to be a steward is to be a manager. Stewardship is managing. And we saw the first week, what is the real focus? So we think of money being the focus of stewardship. What's the real focus of stewardship? Our relationship with God, because it's talking about our heart and our commitment, and that's really the essence of any relationship, is your heart, your commitment toward that person. We saw if uh, we are the stewards, if we're the managers, uh, that's because God is the owner. And what's the foundation for declaring and believing that God is the owner of everything? Two events in uh, history, the first one, creation, creation. and the second one? The, re the death, burial, and resurrection, the cross. Those are what tell us God is our owner. He created us, and then He redeemed us. He bought us back. He owns us. We're the managers. And then last week, we looked at what does stewardship look like. And we said it's not giving a specific percentage, but it is giving proportionately generous and with an element of faith. That is biblical giving, that it's generous uh, for each of us, whatever that entails, uh, and and there is an element to it of having faith, demonstrating faith, living out of faith, not just what we give, but also the rest of all our money, and certainly as we think about our time. And we've been saying that from the very beginning. The, the main idea that has focused this whole sermon is that stewardship is living out and living by my Christian faith. So it, it makes sense that faith would be prominent, and that is going to be our focus today. The faith of stewardship. And there's two ways that stewardship relates to faith. The first one is the faith that stewardship takes. The faith that it takes. You know, our focus as we go through this, I'm going to be talking mainly about money, uh, at times about, uh, at times about time, and uh, at the end I'll wrap it up with time. But a lot of this is going to be about money uh, because as we, we talk about the faith element, you know, we saw last week that tithing is not commanded in the New Testament, but I also said, for many people, that's a, that's a mark of, yeah, that would be generous, that would be an element of faith, and most people know that, but it's been said that the average giving of uh, most believers is around 2.5%, and uh, it's not that that falls short of the 10%, it's that it falls short of the standard of generous and out of faith. Well, why is that? Why do most believers give so little compared to what the biblical standard is? You know, is it because they, they don't know what that standard is? They haven't heard what that standard is? That's not been my experience. What I have seen in my life is that most people give less than even they know they should, they feel that they should, because they think, if I gave that much, I wouldn't have enough. In other words, if I I wouldn't have enough. Let me just make sure I'm plugged in well here. I think so. I'm afraid I wouldn't have enough, which that's fear. And fear is the opposite of faith. As we talk about faith being central to our giving, well, the opposite of it, if we don't have faith, then we have fear. You know, I'm afraid that there, there won't be enough. I'm afraid I'll be, not be able to pay my bills, not be able to get the things maybe that I want. So biblical faith is a key element of biblical giving. And I often point out that as we talk about faith, we have to be careful because we've come in today's culture, especially our American culture, to talk about faith a lot as Christians, but I believe we misuse it. We often talk about, I have faith that, and then we go on to list something that God never promised. Certainly not specifically. Well, if I say I have faith that God is going to do X and God never said it, that's not faith, that's presumption. In the Bible, in the New Testament, you do a search and you will find overwhelmingly it talks about faith in God, who He is, what He's like, not any specific thing He will do. But we can have faith God will provide because God has given us a promise that He will do that. Philippians 4.19 says, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So I can say I have faith that God will supply every need of mine because it says right there, we have that promise. Now, context there, it's what we talked about last week. You remember the Macedonians are the ones who begged Paul. Paul, we want to give to this special offering to help the Christians in Jerusalem. And they themselves didn't have much. They were poor, but they were asking to give. And matter of fact, Paul says they even gave to Paul 
to support his ministry, and not while he was just in Philippi, but while he was in other places. These people were givers, and Paul's writing them and making that promise and telling them. And that's what I want to start by looking at today, is God's promise to provide for our needs. You know, does the Bible indicate, does our biblical giving affect God's actions toward us in any way? If we give, will it change the way God acts toward us? Yes, it absolutely will. Yeah, the Bible makes that clear. Our giving will result, first of all, in God's blessing. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, Paul wrote, we saw this last week, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly, well, they also are going to reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So that's saying that my giving specifically will impact what God does in my life. There is a correlation there. There's a connection. God will work differently in your life if you give, and it says there, even if you give bountifully or if you give sparingly, God's going to act in your life in a different way. Well, number two, God's blessings are primarily spiritual. That's one thing we have to realize because the spiritual dimension of life is primary. It's most important. This is why it says in Luke 16, 11, so if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? So you see this connection there. He's making a contrast between, as he says there, worldly wealth, that physical material wealth, it's money, but then he says, who's going to trust you with true riches? There's the contrast. We would call it worldly wealth riches. Jesus says, yeah, okay, but the true riches, if it's not the worldly wealth, it's spiritual blessings. It's spiritual riches. Those are the most important. The spiritual is most important. But he makes a point. They're linked. And the way God deals with us, they're linked. What we do with our material possessions, with our material finances, will affect how God blesses us spiritually, and the spiritual is most important. So the spiritual, as we talk about God will work in our lives when we give, depending on how we give, certainly we need to realize the way God works primarily will be a spiritual blessing, but don't rule out the physical side. Number three, God's blessings do include a physical dimension. You know, there's two extremes today. The one is to focus on the physical as the health and wealth gospel does. Well, it's all about that. You're obedient to God. You live for God. He's going to bless you with, with health and wealth. And that's an extreme that's wrong. But the other extreme is say, well, there's no physical aspect to God's blessings at all. You can't count on that. It's all going to be just spiritual. As usual, the biblical truth is somewhere in the middle. Matthew 6, 25 to 33, a, a longer passage, but it gives us this point. It says, therefore, Jesus is speaking, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, your physical needs, nor about your body, what will you put on? Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of his life? And why are you so anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O you of little faith. Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But, and here's the key verse, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So that certainly, you can't miss the fact, that is talking about physical needs. God is talking about providing for our physical needs. So when you go back to verse where it talks about God providing for all our needs, the spiritual is primary but the physical is also in there. It is included. Now, one thing we have to realize as we think about God providing for our needs and giving, biblical giving will still require discipline. And once again, this goes against this modern idea of health and wealth, that it's like, oh, well, things are just going to be so abundant, you just give it and it'll be no problem at all. You won't have to do any discipline. Well, first of all, you're going to, it's going to take some discipline to begin giving generously and in faith. 
Because if you're not doing it already, somehow you're going to have to discipline yourself, your spending, your living, to be able to do it unless you've just got piles of money lying around the house that you've been thinking this whole time, I don't know what to do with all these piles of money lying around my house. Most of us aren't in that situation. So you're going to have to discipline yourself in some way to be able to start giving in a way that is truly generous and truly out of faith. Well, as a follower of Christ, we should be willing to do that. That should be something that we say, okay, I committed to that as a believer. Uh, Craig Hood said, too many Christians adjust their standard of giving to their standard of living. In other words, I put myself before God. Here's how I'm living. Let's see what's left for my giving. Well, that's the exact opposite of what we said we would do when we became a Christian. Luke 9, 23, this verse keeps coming up. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. There is that idea of true sacrifice, true discipline. God hears how I've committed to live. It applies to everything in my life, including the giving of my money, including the stewardship of my life. So it's going to take discipline to begin giving generously in faith. And you know what? It's going to take discipline to continue giving generously and in faith. I've found over my life that it may get easier to, to give generously, but it never gets easy. There, there's always something that comes up, uh, something, you know, maybe a bill that makes it difficult, maybe just a thought in my mind, oh, if we weren't given all that money, it's always going to come around in some way, which that requires discipline to maintain that practice. And that's a good thing. Our Christian life, we're supposed to be disciplined, and so something that allows us to develop that discipline is a good thing. 1 Corinthians 9, 25 to 27, Paul says, Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. One of the key lessons, and we're going to focus on it in the, the next point, is that giving isn't just about money. Giving, our money, impacts all of our life. In this sense, it allows us to grow in that area of discipline. And it's very tangible. It helps us grow in ways that impact other areas of our life that aren't as tangible. The next thing to look at here as we talk about the faith that stewardship builds is that God's promises to provide for our promises to provide for our needs, not our wants. That Philippians verse says, and God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Every need. Now, that doesn't say that he won't give enough for us to have some of our wants. It doesn't say that we shouldn't have some things that we want. It just says that's not promised there. We've seen other verses that says God gives us all things for our enjoyment. It goes back to a biblical idea of balance. Where is that? Realize God promises to supply my needs. He doesn't promise to supply the wants. Doesn't mean they're wrong, but I certainly do need to give in a way that's generous and out of faith. Now, I will ask this because maybe, you know, I always wonder if the thought comes to your mind. Are there exemptions and exceptions, let's use that, exceptions to God's promise to supply our needs? God will supply all your needs. Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God. All these things will be given to you. Are there exceptions to that promise? I was thinking, you know, I always try to think of the extreme examples because if you find an example that's extreme, well, that means there is an exception. I think you could say, yeah, there are times where Christians have not had their their need for food. Let's say that. POWs in war. You look at those people who are absolutely just starving to death. Well, their need for food is not being met. That looks like an exception, doesn't it? I think we first get a little, you know, not just a little, maybe all nervous about that. We do have to realize that the, the explanation for things like that is that we do live in a world that is affected by sin, that people make sinful choices in a lot of those situations. They make sinful choices that impact other people. Maybe they made some sinful choices that impacted themselves. 
So God gives that promise. There certainly is that general promise, and, and I hope you've seen it. I've certainly seen it in my life. But you can see the exceptions as a result of sin. Now, one thing I will say, if someone just truly is, has fallen on hard times, the church is to provide for the needs of members. So if you look at some exceptions and say, well, you know, there's exceptions to this. The first thing we saw from Christians in the New Testament, as soon as uh, you know, the 5,000 people became Christians on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people on the day of Pentecost, it was up to 5,000 later. The first thing you see is the church, people who had extra sold to meet those needs. So there never should be needs that are unmet among Christian believers if other Christians have the ability, it may take sacrifice and generosity, to meet those needs. Well, the sixth thing uh, on this is that God's provision will come in God's time and God's ways. <laughs> Don't you always hate that one? <laughs> because rarely is God's timing our timing. When is our time? Now. Yeah, that's usually when I want it. Now. God's timing I found to rarely be now. And there's always a reason for it, though. God in His wisdom knows. God in His wisdom knows not only the right timing, but the right way. And especially in light of the second thing. That's the faith that stewardship ta takes. But there's also the faith that stewardship builds. That's part of its relationship too. That our stewardship will build our faith. You know, biblical giving of our money and our time requires faith. But it also will help us develop and grow and strengthen our faith in two ways. First of all, from seeing God provide. From seeing God provide for our needs. Christians have promises like Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and he'll provide for these needs. If you sow generously, God will, you will reap generously. But you know what? I've come to realize as I see people, we sort of are aware of those promises, but there's a part of us that wonders, really God? <laughs> uh, will you provide for my needs? And that's that part that gives us that fear when we're wondering about, oh, not sure I can give generously because I'm afraid God won't provide for those needs. Well, if you're in that situation, you're not alone. The Israelites in Malachi's day, the, the last prophet of the Old Testament, about 400 years before Christ, they were in that same situation. They had God's promise. Back in Proverbs 3, 9 to 10, God had told Israel, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce, when, and then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. That was the promise they had from God. That's a pretty amazing promise. But we read in Malachi 3.8, Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? How can you even rob God? And he says, in your tithes and your contributions, by not giving them, you have robbed me. And then God says, his response to their robbing him, he says in Malachi 3.10, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I, will not, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Now, there's probably a couple wait a minutes here in that passage. The first one is this idea of testing God. Have you ever read that passage and wondered, and especially in light of the temptations we saw a few weeks ago, where Jesus said, don't put the Lord your God to the test. And here's God saying, test me in this. Well, the test for Jesus was when Satan said, hey, jump off the temple and God will catch you. And Jesus saying, don't put the Lord God to the test. You remember the point there was God hadn't promised anyone, including Jesus, if you jump off the temple, I'll catch you. So that was testing God. Hey, God, will you do this thing? I'm going to try to force your hand. But here God is saying, here's what I'll do. Put me to the test and see. Well, the second uh, wait a minute might be, yes, Steve, but that's Old Testament. That's an Old Testament promise, and you're absolutely right. But we have a New Testament parallel, what we've been seeing, 2 Corinthians 9, 8, where it says, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. That's saying basically the same thing, and that is for us as New Testament believers. We have that promise, and as we've seen, there is an element of the physical to that promise. Well, I still run across people, and I still have moments myself where I'm not sure. Are there moments when you're not sure? Like, it's, boy, that's pretty clear, isn't it? Oh, but God, really? <laughs> if I give generously? Uh, oof, I'm just not sure. I'm not sure what might happen. Do you have moments like that? It's okay to have moments like that. 
What do you do when you have those moments? Well, you do it anyway, <laughs> and you see God provide. You experience God provide. It's a little bit like Mark 9.24 where this man had brought his son who was demon-possessed to the disciples, and they couldn't cast out the demon. Jesus comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration, and the man explains it to him and says, if you can heal him, and Jesus says, if? <laughs> All things are possible to him who believes. And the man says, I believe, help my unbelief. In other words, you know, Jesus, I'm at about, you know, 59% belief, but this whole thing before shook me. I've got about 41% unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. And what happens? Jesus heals his son. You think that helped his unbelief? It did. What we need to realize, we need to separate the idea of our belief from our faith. Our belief is that mental, you know, assent that I believe God can and will provide. But boy, there's a part of me that's not sure. Whereas faith is what do I do? You know, James says faith is made complete by our actions. It's when we're faced with a situation to exercise faith. Do I do it or not? My belief can be partial. Well, God, I believe about 60. I unbelieve about 40. Okay. But your faith is either yes or no. What do you do? Do you act out of the belief or act out of the unbelief? If you act out of the belief, however much it is, you have faith. What do you do? How do you act? That's what the faith is. Well, when we see God provide, that mental belief turns into experience. I see it. It, it helps that faith. It, you, God, I, I believe, help my unbelief. That helps our unbelief quite a bit when we see God provide in different ways. It's the reason that biblical giving is so important because it's so tangible. It's so calculable. God, I've got mortgage due and it's, you know, whatever. It's $1,000 and I've got $800 and God somehow provides. And then you're like, okay, I see it. Black and white, tangible wow, God provided there, I've got this other situation that's far less tangible. I've got this relationship. I've got problems with my, my kids. I've got uncertainty at work. I've got a lack of peace from something. Can you provide for that too, God? Yeah, you can, because I've seen you provide in this other more concrete, tangible way. So I'm going to trust you in this less tangible situation. You know, Lisa and I are at the point that we certainly have more faith than we've ever had in, about whatever situation. But we will both say the thing that has helped us grow our faith more than anything are the financial situations that we've faced and seen God provide for. I think I've shared before, we were at the point literally once in our life where we had $2 to our name. Two dollars. Matter of fact, we had even rolled our coins. You know, if you guys collect coins, throw them in a big bucket, we do that too. We had already rolled our coins a week or so before. We didn't have any coins to roll. We didn't have any room on the credit cards. We didn't have any money in checking. We didn't have any money in savings. We had $2 to our name that day, and we got by. One of the key lessons of faith is it's, you need to know, do I have enough for today? That needs to be your question. Not do I have enough for this bill that's due in a week that I see coming. Do I have enough for today? Give us this day our daily bread. You think that didn't help our faith, our belief? Yeah, quite a bit. But I also would say it's made it easier. It hasn't made it easy. There's still those moments where something happens and you get that knot in the pit of your stomach. You know, Lisa got the call. You're laid off. Like, and what I found, here's a, a point of experience that I hope can be beneficial. Oftentimes, my first response to it is, is total faith, total belief. You get laid off, God's provided before. He'll do it again, hon. It's a few hours later or maybe the next morning or maybe the next day. <laughs> what are we going to do? That's when I struggle. And so watch for that. Your first reaction is one thing. How do you do with it later? So from seeing God provide, it's helped us grow in our faith. But also, God, our faith grows from not seeing God provide. You might think, what? How's that the case? How can they both be true? Well, I remember when I was preaching in Scottsdale and preaching on stewardship, and one of the members who had never given generously you know, or out of faith decided, I'm going to tithe today. And so he gave a tithe, that sermon, right after the sermon, it was the same thing, we had collection boxes on the wall, he gave a tithe, he went to work, he worked an afternoon shift in a sales job, went to work like three hours later or whatever, had the best sales day he'd ever had, came back the next Sunday, he was so excited, <laughs> like, I gave, I tithe, I gave out of faith, and God blessed me like this, it was so amazing to see. Well, God 
blessed him like that, but then you know there's been times in other people's lives, ourselves included, where we've been faithfully giving for a long time and we get down to two bucks. What's up, God? <laughs> Why is that? How can that be? Well, once we've sowed generously and acted in a way that faith dictates and develop faith, God's next step is, okay, I'm going to grow that faith. You know, our, our friend Mike, who gave generously that time, he had a four-hour faith to start with. He, he gave, and about four hours later, he was blessed. About four hours. Well, God says, I want you to have more than a four-hour faith. What if, what if I don't bless you in four hours? What if I don't bless you in 24 hours, 24 days, 24 months? You got a faith that can handle that? God says, I want you to get to a faith that can handle that. Because that's a deeper faith and a deeper relationship. And so there's sometimes when our faith grows by not seeing God provide, it, it gets us to increase our faith from four hours to 24 and beyond. It gets us to increase our faith from a certain thing. You know, Lisa and I, I think now we overlook some things, things that would have totally shaken us to the core in the past. Now it happens and we don't even think about it. But God manages to bring some other things that we do think about. But God wants us to see that growth. He wants all of us to see that growth. Now, I will say this, uh, one thing, because again, I try to think what ideas come up. Biblical giving is not a get-out-of-jail-free card. You can't say, hey, God, I tithe, so this other thing, uh, we're going to overlook that, right? <laughs> no. That's what the Roman Catholic Church was doing. That's what Martin Luther said was wrong, and he was right. It's part of our life. It doesn't overshadow others. Now, I focus mainly on the stewardship of money, like I said today, but it does apply to time. There needs to be some of our time specifically given to God, certainly in our own personal life, our Bible study and our prayer, our time with Him, certainly in a ministry way of something that I'm specifically focused on other people. But also, there needs to be other parts of our time, what we've been talking about lately, that we use all our time in a godly way, that we redeem our time, that we make the use of every opportunity. You know, I first brought that up, I don't know, about four weeks ago. It came up when we were going through Luke. One of the specific examples I said is we've all got to eat. You know, invite someone over to your house to eat. Go out to lunch with someone, dinner. Spend time. And in that, you don't even necessarily have to talk about Bible things, Christian things. Just some fellowship with each other. Talk about life, what's going on. Your godly values will come into that. I mentioned that, I don't know, about four weeks ago. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. Have you done that? You know, I got to thinking, Christians in other parts of the world are facing all kinds of hardships and persecutions. Our challenge, the past, you know, four weeks ago, eat with someone. That one's not too tough. But it's a way to redeem our time, to make use of every opportunity. Every time I eat, I have the opportunity to eat with someone else. Maybe not for breakfast. You probably don't want to invite them over while you're in your pajamas. But... Dinners, times like that, somehow between the last four weeks, have you had opportunities? That's being a steward of my time. It's using it in a way that's faith. You might think, oh, I just don't have time. I'm too busy. Why don't you trust God and see what he does? All right, I always like to end with what do I need to do now? So take this for today for the whole series. Three questions to ask. If I'm not giving biblically, which again is proportionately generous and out of faith, why is that? Why am I not giving in a way that meets that biblical standard? And if the answer is fear, of what? What is it you're afraid of? Second, what would it look like for me to practice godly stewardship of my money and time? Just stop and think about it. To be a good steward, a good manager of what God has given me, here's what it would look like for my money, and here's what it would look like for my time. And then third, do I have the mental belief that God will provide what I need? Do I believe He will? And the second part of that is whether I believe it 100% or not, what will I do? Will I act out of my belief or act out of my unbelief? Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. For believers, we want to please God. That verse says you, you, you don't have a chance if you're not living a life of faith. Stewardship is living out and living by my Christian faith. No matter what we do, God is great, is he not? Let's stand up and sing about that as we leave. He's done great things. Bow at his feet, he has done great.